Well, hi, everybody. Good to have you here. We're going to uh, finish up the second half of chapter three. So let me begin, as I always do, by sharing the PowerPoint. So in the previous Zoom lecture, we had finished up uh, staining. And I had outlined, I think, several types of stains, uh, including acid fast stain, gram stain, and, and endospore stain. And we'll be doing all of those in lab uh, within the next several weeks. Uh, we want to pick up with section 3.4 in your textbook that talks about some additional features of the six eyes. If you remember from last uh, Zoom lecture, those eyes included inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, information gathering, and finally identification. So we're picking up, I guess, with inoculation growth and, and IDing cultures. One thing that we have to be constantly aware of, especially in the laboratory, is the issue of potential contamination of our cultures because there are going to be times, especially when you get your unknown, for example, in another month or so, that we don't want any other types of bacteria growing in our, our media. Um, so you're gonna be learning starting next week, some, some steps that we're going to be following. In fact, you've already learned a little bit about aseptic technique, which begins by wiping down your tabletop with the disinfectant and washing your hands. Those are actually steps that we could include under the heading aseptic technique. But most of the time we think about uh, transfer processes and how we manipulate the Bunsen burner in relation to the tubes. So we're gonna be learning about that very shortly. But it's really, really critical, obviously, to be able to maintain whatever desirable bacteria we want in a given medium. And typically we want a pure culture, which you may remember is um, a culture of a single species of, we'll just use bacteria as an example because that's what we'll be growing in lab. Not only do we want to avoid having contaminants, i.e. other species of bacteria getting into our broth or into our slant or onto our plate, but we wanna also be cognizant of the fact that um, we don't want to introduce pathogens, potentially infectious agents into the environment if we're working with a potentially uh, nasty type of pathogen, for example, if we're working for the CDC, for example, uh, we want to make sure we're not increasing the risk of it getting beyond our laboratory table or hood or wherever we're, we're, we're working. So we want to always just avoid potential contamination, either of our culture or of our environment. We're going to be talking in a few moments about how we can isolate bacteria if given a mixed culture. In fact, in this particular diagram, here we have two different species of bacteria, which are illustrated, of course, by the yellow circles. We call those uh, a, a coccus morphology, spherical coccus. And then we have, of course, the orange rod-shaped morphology or shape. That's referred to as the bacillus form or shape of a bacteria. So let's pretend again, we have this mixed culture of both coccus and bacillus shaped bacteria, two different species. How can we isolate them? Because what we wanna often do is take that mixed culture and separate out all of those individual components or species so that we have individual colonies. And of course, on our Petri plate down here, we see those particular uh, cocci, that's the plural term for coccus, uh, these cocci eventually are separated from one another as individual cells that in turn then undergo binary fission and reproductive processes that result in the formation of what is called a colony. So obviously you see here two colonies in yellow of the coccus morphology bacteria. 
and we have three of the red color colonies that contain strictly these bacillus-shaped species of, of bacteria. So we can obviously macroscopically see the, those colonies, as you will soon when you pull out your petri plates from the incubator, you're going to see different colors, different shapes that, that indicate different species of, of microorganism. Those could be bacteria, those could be fungi, for example. And each one of those colonies started from a single cell. That's, that's what we, we try to do when we isolate bacteria, we try to spread them out such that we have individual cells, which in turn become colonies that we can then identify. Now, we're going to be doing staining very shortly in lab. We're going to be looking at the microscopic aspect of these bacteria. We're going to evaluate their shape. We're going to evaluate their staining properties, right? We're going to eventually get more information about hopefully what the identification is of those particular bacteria that were at one time mixed with other bacteria, right? Which is often the case when you think about a patient providing a sputum sample, a blood sample, a stool sample, that's containing dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe one could even argue hundreds of different species of different bacteria. Yeah, so it gets, it gets pretty complicated. So let's talk about three different isolation techniques. We're going to be performing actually all of these in lab. The first of which is the streak plate technique. The streak plate technique basically involves utilizing an auger plate, which you see up here, of course, in the upper right hand corner, and an inoculating loop. And we'll be introducing that coming up in lab very shortly. But what you basically do is you obtain a sample. It could be from a broth. It could be from a, a slant, which we'll, we'll show you those coming up soon in lab. It could even be coming from a plate, theoretically. But it, that particular inoculum that you're going to be getting on the tip of that little wire loop, that contains more than one species of bacteria. Let's just make that assumption from the get-go. And we want to separate these out to individual colonies. That's the goal here. Isolate the colonies. Isolate the various species within that sample that we picked up with the loop. And so it involves streaking, as the name implies. What you basically do is you take your loop and you streak a quadrant of the plate you then flame the loop to kill and remove any bacteria that might be still present on it. And then you overlap a portion of that first quadrant and you streak a second quadrant. And you flame that loop again and you overlap a little bit of the second quadrant into a third quadrant. Oops, sorry. And finally, you flame that loop one last time and you do your last quadrant streak, overlapping a little bit of the third quadrant. Now think about what's going on as you streak from the first to the second, to the third, to the fourth quadrants. You are in essence spreading out those bacteria, aren't you? And that's what's occurred up here in our plate that we've just pulled out of the incubator. We see that there are two different colors present here, obviously the, the red and the orange indicating two different species in that original mixed culture that we obtained with our loop. And you can see how this first quadrant, there's red and, and yellow mixed together. But as we streak into subsequent second and third and fourth quadrants, we have eventually isolation. And I, I misspoke because there's actually three different species here, right? There's not just the red and the yellow. Look at these guys here, these kind of clearer, well, they're not really clear, but they're more opaque white, aren't they? So there was three species of bacteria in that original loop that we started with. And we eventually spread those out in ever decreased number to the point at which we have isolated colonies. The goal, again, isolated colonies. And we've got that. We've got nice isolation. 
Now, sometimes it takes four, four quadrants to get your isolation. In some instances, you can get isolation in the third quadrant. One could argue maybe that some of these, for example, are separated from other yellow and other red and other white colonies. Um, so you don't always get isolation in the fourth. You might get it in the third. It just depends. I don't really care how you get it as long as you have isolation. That's the goal, right? So uh, check out that YouTube video. It does a nice job kind of going through some of the steps. Um, and there are different ways of doing streaking, streak plates. So uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? And this is a great example of that. So we'll, we'll be seeing that um, both in lab and as you watch this video, keep in mind there are several ways of doing that. Here's a second way of isolating called the pour plate technique. And in the pour plate technique, what you basically do is you start with three empty sterile Petri plates. Okay, so pretend these are empty. And you have three test tubes that contain liquid auger. Now we haven't talked about auger, but we will very shortly, but this is a, a type of medium that we can grow bacteria in. In fact, you remember seeing the auger plate the other day, I think, when we did the ubiquity of bacteria exercise. So you have some sense of what that is, that's, that, that's semi-solid material. However, if we heat that up, okay, it becomes a liquid. And that is the case here in these three tubes. They have been warmed sufficiently so that they, they are maintained in the liquid state. As they cool down to 42 degrees Celsius, this liquid will solidify into what you know as the, 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 the semi-solid auger. But we keep these warm. We keep them above 42. We usually keep them above 55 degrees or so Celsius. And what we're doing initially is we're taking our loop, okay, that came from the same sample that we had started with way up here, okay, that was that the culture that had the three types of bacteria in it, remember the red and the, the yellow and the white. And we introduce a loop full of that mixed culture into our first test tube, we'll call it test tube number one. That test tube is then mixed to agitate the cells and kind of spread them out into that column of liquid. And then we will aseptically transfer a loop full of A into the liquid auger, sterile liquid auger, and test tube B. That tube will then also be mixed to spread out the cells. And we will aseptically transfer a loop from test tube two into test tube number three, which contains sterile liquid auger. And we'll mix that tube up. And then the three tubes are poured into the representative empty sterile plates that will be labeled one, two, and three. So we know that again, plate one came from tube one and so on and so forth. Now note what should happen after we incubate those plates and we pull them out of the incubator and look at them, which is going to have the more abundant number of colonies. Well, obviously it's gonna be number one and the least number should be in number three. So this is sort of what you might see when you pull you know, tube number or plate number three out from the incubator, for example. We have isolation, don't we? We have the red, we have the yellow, and we have the white colonies. These, again, developed from single cells that divided asexually. We'll talk about how that process occurs in an upcoming chapter. But those individual colonies contain millions and millions of cells, all of the same species, right? The red's unique, the yellow's unique, and the white, a third species. So that's another way of getting isolation called the, the pore plate or serial dilution technique. And then there's finally the spread plate technique. This is, um, somewhat similar to the pore plate technique in that you set up a series of serial dilutions, meaning that you have you know, a, a lot of bacteria in the first tube, less in the second, less in the third, for example, and maybe even you use a fourth or a fifth tube, just depends on how, how far you wanna go with this. 
And then you would take a quantity of the liquid and we probably wouldn't use um, auger. This would probably be like a saline solution, a sterile saline solution that we would use. And then we would take and pipette a, a, a small volume from each of these tubes and put that onto the surface of a pre-poured auger plate. And then we would use a, use a special little glass or you can also uh, ha uh, use these disposable plastic uh, hockey sticks. That's what they kind of look like. And you just gently spread the uh, dilution that you've placed on the surface of the plate. You spread that out over the surface. So it's, so it's all over the surface of the plate. Very gently do so, so you don't dig into the auger. You gotta be a little careful. And then you will incubate that, okay? And you pull that plate out, for example, after being incubated for 24 to 48 hours, and notice we've got isolation, don't we? Now, again, it depends upon what the dilution factor is of that plate as to what gives the best isolation. We'll be doing a lab on this coming up, you know, in another couple months. So check out this uh, hyperlink and watch that for about six minutes or so. It goes through some different uh, examples of these isolation techniques. Inspection. Let's take a look macroscopically at these plates. We've already actually done that, haven't we, a little bit? If we have a single species, we said we have a pure culture. If we have more than one organism, species of organism in that sample, we have a mixed culture. And so as we look at these various media, let's go from left to right. And you tell me, is this a pure culture or is this evidence of a mixed culture? This looks like a streak plate, doesn't it? Yeah. And if you said mixed, you were right, because we have both the yellow and the white cream-colored colonies. Nice isolation here, by the way. How about our second plate? Looks also like a streak plate. If you said mixed, you're right, because obviously we have the uh, very colorful red colonies and we've got some white here as well. How about our last diagram here or photograph of the three auger slants? Well, if you said pure culture, you're right. Each of these slants has a single species of bacteria growing on the surface of that auger. Maybe we took a little loopful from this colony, this white colony, and we placed it in this sterile slant and we put it in the incubator for a day or two. That's what we get. Or maybe we took a, a loopful from this colony, this yellow guy, and placed it into a sterile slant and grew it for 24 to 48 hours in the incubator. That's what we get. And the same for the red, pure cultures. We also, want to eventually come to a point at which can, where we can begin to identify what these various organisms are. We've, we've started with a pure cult or with a mixed culture and we've isolated them, okay, either with the streak plate or the poor plate technique, you know, um, spread plate technique. Now we've got to take some steps to try to figure out what exactly is the ID. And that's again what you're going to be doing coming up soon with your unknown. We can plate out those bacteria. We can look at colony properties, the shape of the colony, the color of the colony, the actual margin even of the colony, back to this idea of shape. There's a whole host of um, characteristics that we can ascribe to a colony. We can even describe the growth in a broth. Um, there are a myriad of ways of sort of um, descriptors to to help us better uh, ascertain the morphology of the bacteria that we're working with, just with the naked eye. Or, and, or, we will stain those cells, right? We'll do a gram stain, maybe. Uh, maybe an endospore stain, if we suspect there are endospores present. If it's a bacillus-shaped bacteria, we might want to do an endospore stain. Um, so staining can help uh, and go a long way to eliminate uh, particular uh, species of bacteria. Um, in higher level um, laboratories, uh, we might sequence the DNA of the bacteria 
that could be very, very helpful in helping us figure out what it is we're working with. Um, biochemical testing. This is what you're going to be doing in a couple of weeks. We're going to subject your unknown to a whole host, a whole battery of physiologic tests using a multitude of different media, both broths and semi-solid and uh, semi-liquid media. Immunological testing, we won't really be doing much of this, looking at antigens and antibodies. That's, that's a very high level uh, of testing. Uh, and finally, this miniaturized multi-test system, which I'm going to just spend a few moments talking about, uh, is something that some of you will be able to make use of with your unknown if you are able to um, narrow down the identity of your uh, unknown as falling within this family of bacteria. So this is a family taxon. It's referred to as the Enterobacteriaceae family. Say that fast five times or try to spell it, right? That's a bizarre spelling, isn't it? So the family Enterobacteriaceae contains bacteria that are um, gram-negative rods. And if you have one of those, you may be able to use this API 20E system. It's a very interesting um, rapid multi-test system. I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail with it now, but basically you have this strip that contains 21 wells. These wells uh, initially contain dehydrated media and you add um, sterile water to these to, to uh, basically uh, dissolve this media. And then you inoculate these 21 wells and look for color changes, basically. Uh, there's some other tests you have to be more specific about in terms of uh, adding mineral oil to create an anaerobic environment and so on and so forth. We're going to talk more about that down the road, so don't get worried about that at this point. But it's really great because you can do all of these tests in one fell swoop, basically, right? And then you incubate that for 18 to 24 hours. You pull it out of the incubator. You determine whether you've got a positive or a negative test result for each of these 21 wells. If you get a positive test, you put a little plus in that little well. This is a little strip you're going to be getting. So if, if uh, this first uh, cup you will gave you a positive test, you put a little plus. If you got a negative test, say in number two here, you put a little minus and so on and so forth. So you can go across all of these wells, uh, determine again, positive or negative, and then what you do basically, you see that these are divided up into um, uh, groups of three, I think here, right? So the first three is considered one group and so on and so forth. You tally up the points. So the first well is given one point. So you got one here, you've got four here, one plus four is five. So you just basically tally up the number of points and you end up basically with a, uh, what, a seven digit number, right? And then you go to a book and you look up the seven digit number and it should tell you the identification of your bacteria. In this case, E. coli. So more on that coming up. Some of you will be able to use, be able to use that. Another uh, technique that you will all be making use of in trying to identify your unknown is by utilizing a number of different keys. And so what you in essence do is you kind of work your way on down these keys. So let's assume you have a gram-negative coccus morphology as determined by staining. Okay, you do the gram stain, you find that it's red and it's got little circles. Then you have to ask yourself, did the oxidase, oxidase test we did on that unknown give us a negative or a positive test result? If it gave us a positive, we have to then ask ourselves, did it ferment this sugar maltose or not? And so you just, in essence, work your way down. These are called uh, dichotomous keys. And there's a whole slug of dichotomous keys on the internet. There's some in your lab book that we will refer to when we get to that point in the, in the uh, lab. Uh, and they are all very helpful. And again, ultimately hoping to give us the correct identity of our bacterial unknown. Okay, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about media. We've already described bras, and I've already shown you some auger plates, so you have some sense of, of what some of this is already. But it wasn't until the 1800s that microbiologists began to um, understand that they could develop 
artificial growing media to grow these bacteria in the laboratory. They needed to have some standard media to use. And they also understood that some microorganisms, uh, we'll call them sort of like generalists in the sense that they can grow and love to grow on all sorts of, of media. They don't, they're, they're not very picky eaters, if you will. However, there are some species of bacteria that are much more difficult to grow because they have very specific requirements that they have to have in terms of nutrients before you can grow them in the laboratory. So we'll, we'll call those the needy bacteria. So scientists have developed different types of media, hundreds of different kinds to grow, culture, and identify a whole host of bacteria and, and even you know, fungi too, for that matter. So we're gonna talk about media as it pertains to the physical state of the material, the media. What is it made up of chemically? And also the fact that some media have specific functional uh, attributes to them. We, we grow bacteria in certain types of media that allow us say to differentiate one from another. That's what I mean by functional. So let's start with the physical states. Again, you've seen the broth, you've worked with the broth in lab last week. This is a liquid medium. I, I believe we used triptychase soy broth in lab last week, where you sampled something and you with your sterile swab and you then uh, broke that swab uh, off uh, or the wooden applicator off and dropped the swab into the, the TSB. You'll be looking at, at that tube next week if you haven't already done so. And so when we have a clear broth, this indicates no growth. This is what it should look like when you get it from me or from Deb, our lab tech. She makes these up, she sterilizes them so they're clear. No growth, no bacteria. This is showing slight turbidity. In other words, you can't read through this very well, right? If you put printed material on the other side of that tube, you might be able to make out letters, but it's not gonna be nearly as readable as it would be if you put it behind the sterile uh, tube. Here's obviously some great turbidity, indicating a lot of growth. And one thing we have to be cognizant of is if tubes are left to sit long enough, sometimes they can develop sediment in the bottom. And so when we get that tube, if we wanna inoculate from it, we would have to mix that solution to agitate the sediment, ag agitate the cells and get them to be distributed throughout the liquid column. And we'll talk about how to do that coming up soon too. Semi-solid media is between the solid and the liquid state. And we won't be using a whole bunch of semi-solid types of media. I will show you one here in just a moment, but note, that it does have some auger in it. Now the auger is gonna act as a solidifying agent. So it's gonna give this semi-solid medium a very um, gelatinous sort of consistency. So just before jello solidifies, it's kind of like this half solid gelatinous material and liquid, right? It's kind of like a clot. And the uh, semi-solid media that we'll be using in lab is called SIM medium, medium, SIM. SIM stands for sulfur indole motility. What this basically means, and I won't go into a lot of detail about it right now, but you can assess three different uh, biochemical attributes, whether the uh, bacterium is able to utilize uh, sulfur, whether it produces this compound called indole and whether or not the bacteria is motile, whether it can move. Yes, some bacteria do move. They have flagella, which we'll talk about coming up in the next chapter. So if you turn that um, tube that contains the sim media kind of on its side, like you're seeing here, you can see how it is, is starting to kind of try to run back up into the tube, but it can't do so very well because it's this semi-solid. Once you um, inoculate SIM 
these are the sort of possible outcomes, which again, I'm not gonna get into details of this right now, but here's the stab line. We use a, a needle, not a, not a loop. So we get some inoculum and we stab it right down the center of the, of the medium. And so here you can see the stab line, this white uh, is indicating bacterial growth. This is indicating a motile bacterium. See how the white has spread out beyond the stab line? Here the growth is right at the stab line. Here it's begun to move out from the stab line. This is indicating motility. This is negative motility. This is positive motility. And this black residue is indicating the presence of hydrogen sulfide. That's part of the sulfur part here. So it's, uh, it makes this H2S compound and it turns the medium black. So more on that coming up. It's a very cool medium to use. You're gonna be using agar a lot. And uh, this is the solid form although it's really sort of gelatinous. Remember, I, I walked around and had you each put your finger inside uh, the plate uh, the other day. So it's easily broken, uh, the surfaces. So it's a, it's a solid, but it's a soft solid. This auger, which generally in most uh, media is between one and 5%, that's sort of the volume. Uh, is produced by a certain type of red algae of all things. I'm not exactly sure how they synthesize and make the agar, but it comes uh, to us in a powder. And what Deb then does is she adds a certain amount of distilled water to the powdered agar, and that of course dissolves it. And then she will uh, at some point in time sterilize that agar and then place it into the uh, test tubes um, where they become eventually auger slants, or she can pour them into sterile plastic petri plates, and we've got auger plates. Now, you heard me mention earlier when we were discussing the uh, pour plate technique that auger, when it reaches 42 degrees Celsius, will solidify. If we want to keep it in the liquid state, We've got to place it into a beaker of water whose temperature is at least 55 degrees or higher. Now, what Deb will do is she will actually boil that powdered agar in with the distilled water. So she, she boils it to make sure it's, it's properly uh, dissolved in the, uh, the water. Um, but as it cools down toward 42, it would eventually gel up like it's done here in this tube. So as long as you keep it above 42, it should stay liquid. Uh, generally, when we go to pour plates, we like to have the, the tubes here at 55 degrees. If we have it too hot, okay, let's say we pour it at 100. If you pour this at 100, number one, it's gonna be a hot tube. We can use a glove and it's no big deal. But when it gets poured into the plate and you put the lid back on top, as quickly as you're done pouring it, that lid's got to get placed on top to avoid contamination. You're going to get massive condensation here on the inner surface of the lid if it's at a very hot temperature. At 55 degrees, it's cool enough that it's, going to, it's not going to condense, but it's warm enough that it's not going to gel before you pour it. Now, this third bullet is extremely important, and I want to just dispel this, this myth that a lot of students have about auger. The auger in plates and slants and so forth is not a food source for the bacteria. It is simply a solidifying agent. That's all it is. It's an agent to help solidify the auger. The bacteria don't eat the auger. They utilize what's in the auger to metabolize. In labs coming up, I'm gonna be taking you into the prep room. I'm gonna be showing you some of these media uh, and how Deb um, goes to make slants and plates and broths and so forth. But this is, again, what we get when we order nutrient agar or nutrient broth. It comes in a bottle in the powdered form. And uh, as I said earlier, it's a matter of just adding a certain uh, amount of water to a, a pre-measured weight of the medium. It's very simple to make media. It's like following a recipe. If you can follow a recipe, 
you can make these different media in the laboratory. It's actually kind of fun to do. Okay, let's shift from the physical state to the chemical composition. We mentioned a little bit earlier that some bacteria are, uh, are kind of picky, fussy eaters, while others are happy with whatever you give them. They're generalists, so to speak. If you're dealing with a fastidious or picky eater, if you will, then you may want to use what we refer to as a synthetic type of media in which to grow your bacteria. If you're working at a major uh, laboratory, a university laboratory, or if you're working for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, for example, you would make use of what we call synthetic media, whose chemical recipe, if you will, is extremely precise down to the most um, small quantity of a given nutrient it, that, that you could possibly imagine. I'll show you an example of this in just a minute. Compare and contrast the synthetic recipe, if you will. We have the exact chemical formula and, and quantity of all of the ingredients to a complex or non-synthetic type of media. This is what we use in our labs. We use non-synthetic or complex. There is a whole host of different animal and plant extracts coupled with agar, if it's gonna be an agar medium. Um, and let me just kind of cut to the chase and go to this next slide and ask you this question. If you were our lab tech, which recipe would you rather follow? Would you rather follow this synthetic media to make, or would you rather go with the non-synthetic or complex medium to make? So notice the brain heart, brain heart infusion broth has what, basically four ingredients, right? Compare that to the synthetic medium that has a whole host of amino acids of specific quantity, okay, you, you have to weigh these out on the balance, the electronic balances in the lab, and then you have to add specific small quantities of vitamins. I mean, this is, this is just, you would need special sorts of instruments to be able to measure out moles and micrograms of vitamins. So it's a much, much more cumbersome, time-consuming, expensive endeavor to, to make these synthetic uh, types of media, which is, which is what some bacteria need. They're not gonna grow in a non-synthetic complex medium, for example. Staph aureus needs real specific ingredients. Well, staph, uh, this particular uh, type of staph aureus um, doesn't necessarily need such uh, a prescribed set of ingredients. Functional types of media. Well, we just mentioned a moment ago that if a bacterium isn't very fussy, it's not very fastidious, then we can use um, non-synthetic all-purpose types of media. So you saw the brain-heart infusion just a moment ago. Um, you know about tryptocase soy broth. Uh, we'll be using a lot of tryptocase soy agar. We'll be using lots of nutrient agar and nutrient broth in our lab uh, experiences coming up in the next uh, 12 weeks or so. Sometimes we may need to utilize enriched media. In other words, we take, in essence, a general purpose medium and we add to that, we add special types of growth factors. So this is sort of a, a kind of a level in between the synthetic and non-synthetic, I guess I would think of it as. Um, some fastidious microbes might grow best in what we call blood agar. I'm gonna show you blood agar in just a moment. Um, we've had this agar supplemented with sheep blood, 
So here are two types of auger, blood auger on the left and something called chocolate auger on the right. Each of these two media has been enriched with special types of growth factors, special type of chemicals, to promote the growth, in this case, of a species of Streptococcus called pyogenes. This is the genus, this is the species. Again, we know this is a scientific Latin name because it's italicized, as is this name. Capital S and capital Y indicate that these are genus terms. And the second word, remember, is the species. So we use, again, enriched media to provide those added growth requirements for certain kinds of bacteria. Selective and differential. These are really interesting functional types of media that allow us to selectively grow or inhibit the growth of different kinds of bacteria. So let's say you had a mixed culture you obtained from a, from a patient and you want to promote the growth of a particular type of bacteria while inhibiting the growth of other types of bacteria. One such selective medium, which happens to also be differential, is mannitol salt auger. We'll be using this coming up later in the semester. Mannitol salt auger gets the name from the presence of the sugar, mannitol, but it also has a high concentration of sodium chloride in it. This is, this is much higher than most media. Most of the time, bacteria do not like it salty because it's a hypertonic solution and they'll basically lose water and they'll shrink up, die, kills them. Not all bacteria, however, um, hate salt. There are certain types of bacteria called halophilic. They love salty environments. And so if we try to culture bacteria on a mannitol salt auger plate, those that love salt will grow great there. Those that don't grow salt, don't love salt, will not grow well there. So again, we're, we're being selective. We're trying to promote the growth of certain types of bacteria, certain species, while inhibiting the growth of others. This could be helpful in helping us narrow down the identification of our, of our, of our bacteria in a mixed culture, for example. Now, the reason that this plate looks pink is because it has a special type of dye in it. And if the bacteria growing on here um, produce acids, they will turn this plate from pink to yellow. And here's what I'm talking about. Here we have cultured two different species of Staphylococcus. We have one here on the left, S stands for Staphylococcus. Epidermitis is the species. And then here's Staphylococcus aureus. Now, you can abbreviate, like I've shown here, if you know what S stands for. But Staphylococcus is not the only S genus. Have you ever heard of Streptococcus, strep throat? The answer is yes. You've all heard of strep throat. Strep throat is due to Streptococcus, which is another genus. So all I'm saying is if you use S and you're welcome to abbreviate the genus, I would write out the species all the time. Just make sure that you know this is not Streptococcus, that it's Staphylococcus. And the reason you know that is because of the species or you'll, you'll begin to associate species with genus. It just takes some practice and uh, working with them a while. So, okay, we have the same genus here, two different species of of Staphylococcus growing. Both grow here, okay, because Staph likes salt, grows great. Other species of bacteria, E. coli, for example, won't grow well on here. But you'll notice that in addition to the presence of colonies, and it looks like this was kind of like streaked, right? Because we got some isolation here, don't we? Which is kind of interesting. Notice that this uh, part of the plate containing Staph aureus has turned yellow 
So this is indicating that there's been some fermentation of the, of the sugar. And whenever you have fermentation, that usually results in the formation of acids, which lowers the pH, which causes the color change from pink to yellow. So we can differentiate epidermitis from aureus by looking at the color. We also know that this mantle salt is selective in terms of its ability to prevent the growth of other types of bacteria while promoting the growth of staph. So it's both selective and differential. So that's kind of cool. Here's another example of a selective and differential medium. It's, it's got a funny name, it's called McConkie auger. Uh, I don't know the derivation of where this word McConkie came from. It could have been from the fella that, that invented this or came up with it, I, I'm just not quite sure. But notice that it indicates here that you can differentiate between lactose fermenting bacteria as evidenced by the dark red centers of these colonies from lactose negative bacteria, those that don't or aren't able to ferment this particular sugar. So these with, with a white non-red center would be lactose negative. So you can grow bacteria on this McConkie auger and it'll help you differentiate between those two categories of bacteria, lactose fermenting and non-fermenting. Another type of uh, differential medium is referred to here as triple sugar iron auger. These are for slants, auger slants. And of course you can see the, the various colors going on here. Here is the, the control. This is what comes out of the autoclave. This is what's, what you're gonna be getting, if you will, if you're gonna be inoculating uh, a TSA, TSI, excuse me, TSI slant. You could get any number of different possible color outcomes depending upon the biochemical uh, property of the bacterium you're inoculating. So again, it helps us to differentiate from one bacterial species from another, depending upon the type of uh, colors that we would see on these slants after they've been uh, incubated. And Finally, uh, as we begin to wrap up the chapter here, um, he, this is a very interesting um, type of auger. I've not ever used it. I've just read about it, this uh, chromagar orientation auger, it's called. And what somebody has uh, done here is they've taken a loop and they've taken some E. coli and they've literally spelled E dot coli when they inoculated the surface of the plate. And they, they did the same thing for Klebsiella. So this is another genus of bacteria. And this is another genus of bacteria and so on and so forth. Um, these are two different kinds of, of staph. Uh, and in essence, what this will tell you is the identity of the unknown. If it's pink, if the, if the, if the colonies are pink, it's E. coli. If the colonies have this kind of shiny dark blue, it's a Klebsiella. If it's sort of a cream, it's a proteus species and so on and so forth. So you just look at the color and it tells you a lot about what you're you know, working with. So it helps to differentiate uh, you know, six different species of bacteria just based on color. That's pretty crazy. Um, actually, we talked a little bit about dyes earlier with respect to the, the mannitol salt auger. Remember we said that that plate was pink because um, it um, was, was able to differentiate bacteria that, able, that uh, produced acids and then would turn yellow. Okay, so it was a pH indicator basically in that auger. There are a whole host of uh, both solid auger and liquid broth media that have various pH indicators added to them. And one test you're gonna be doing in a couple of weeks when you get your unknown is a whole bunch of carbohydrate fermentation tests. You'll be inoculating your unknown into I think four or five different sugar tubes, each of which has phenol red added to it. So when you look at these four or five tubes, they all have sort of this darker red color to them 
And this, by the way, is called a durum tube. It's an inverted little test tube inside the larger test tube, but it's open at the bottom. And so you can't really tell by looking at this tube which sugar is present. Now, Deb's going to have them all labeled, so we'll know which one is sucrose, which one is mannitol, which one is lactose, and so on and so forth. But if your bacterium is able to ferment the sugar in the tube, it's going to cause a color change to yellow, like we see here on the right hand side. Notice also, in addition to the color change indicating that fermentation of that sugar had occurred, there's also a little gas bubble inside the durum tube. This is actually carbon dioxide that forms as a result of the fermentation process and it accumulates here in the tube. And this can actually fill with enough CO2 where it begins to float here up to the surface of the, of the film, this uh, uh, upper part of the, the tube, right near the film area where it meets the air. Um, so you look for two things with respect to carbohydrate fermentation. You look for color change from red to yellow, and you look for the presence of gas in the durum tube. Okay, well, that wraps up chapter three. And we'll uh, be starting chapter four next.